Recording in progress. Hello and welcome to the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone, Biotone Edu Partner Program and Massage Industry Experts. With the challenges that have faced massage schools, students and practicing therapists, thanks to COVID and its variants, the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone continues to support virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise on topics, not only for class discussion, but career success. Tonight's expert is Sandy Fritz, a well-known, active, and vocal voice in the massage community. She's a practicing massage therapist, a massage school owner and educator, and author of two industry textbooks, Fundamentals of Therapeutic Massage and Massage Therapy Review. Sandy has also co-authored on other titles. As if this wasn't enough on her plate, about five years ago, Sandy became a massage therapy franchise owner, which gives her a unique perspective on presenting today's EduTalk on career pathways. Let's listen and learn as Sandy shares insights, options, obstacles, and trends in the industry to help you create a successful massage career. From being self-employed with a home or a mobile office to being an employee working in wellness and fitness centers, hotels and luxury spas, medical and clinical settings, and in franchises or chains, there's confusion, confusion in the community as to how and where massage therapists practice. She'll address the confusion about career pathways to assist you in determining the best career path for you, your personality, your professional goals, and your ultimate career success. Before I turn it over to Sandy, she has asked that at the end of her PowerPoint presentation, we all turn on our video and we all unmute ourselves to participate in an active audience discussion on careers. If you'd like to chat, any comments or questions, feel free to chat those during her presentation and those as well will be addressed. We look forward to seeing you and hearing your thoughts, comments, and concerns. Okay, Sandy, I'm turning it over to you, and I'll be back at the end of your PowerPoint. Oh, it's so all much. yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. And um, I'm gonna get my share screen up. And like was mentioned, uh, I don't wanna lecture at you tonight. Um, I want to, the PowerPoint is to uh, stimulate some thought process and see if we can't, you know, identify some of the things and maybe bring some clarity to some of the areas around massage careers. Um, one of the issues with massage therapy as a career is that we can go multiple ways we can have multiple facets of our career. Um, and sometimes the so many choices can add to the confusion, especially when you're uh, newer into the massage therapy occupation. So, and a lot has changed. You know, it's, I've been doing massage for over 40 years. I've personally been self-employed that whole time. And I worked full time. I supported a family. Uh, and if I had the options back then that I have now, I think life would have been a lot easier. But back in the day, 
you you had self-employed was all you had there were very few other options and now there are so many and as an educator um uh, an entry-level educator teaching entry-level students it's so nice to be able to provide uh, a career pathway and career options so the slides that i'm going to just flip through pretty fast here again are to stimulate uh, conf uh stimulate confusion we already have enough of that stimulate conversation here so these are all of the different places that massage therapy and uh, massage therapists can practice and whether it's self-employed or an employee or combined part-time employee part-time self-employed you can be in a wellness environment, a clinical environment, a, a medical environment, uh, a franchise, a chain. Those are not the same thing. Uh, you can be in a private office, a home office, mobile. You, you can do all of those. Um, and again, each of them, there's a foundation that's similar. Um, but then there is a lot of variation. One of the things with entry level <clears throat> is what do I need to have to set up to practice? And all you need is license. You need to be compliant with your state government, and you also need for your facilities to be compliant with local zoning. Um, what I've got here on the, the slide is the Model Practice Act that the Federation of State Massage Boards put together a few years ago that talks about kind of how we define our scope of practice. And it is, it is the state uh, that is going to set the definition for massage, which is also going to define your scope of practice. So that's it. Any other specialization or, or certification that you might get like board certification, all the rest of that is voluntary. Um, so according to this Model Practice Act, massage, the practice of massage therapy means the manual application of a system of structured touch to the soft tissues of the human body but not limited to, and then all of these different things. That's a very broad scope of practice. Um, the main limitation we have with scope of practice is we cannot diagnose nor prescribe. And so our focus is primarily working in the wellness um, aspect and then supportive if somebody has more complex situations. But not only do we have massage, we also have hydrotherapy and we can use assistive devices like the percussion guns. And uh, so again, um, a very broad, very broad scope of practice. So, some of the things that uh, support a career pathway would be uh, an area of concentrated focus. Now, I didn't start out with this, but I fell into about 25 years ago, longer than that now even, uh, working with professional athletes. And I am the clumsiest person you ever saw and not athletically inclined at all. Um, but I'm an excellent problem solver and I am a lifelong learner and I fit in that environment um, very well. Um, so that's how I developed that layer of specialization. Never took a class. You know, it was all based on experience. Um, so when you look to go, all right, I've got my license. What, what, how do I want to evolve? Where do I want to go with that? And so all of those are voluntary. Nothing is mandated other than licensing. So experience in self-teaching or, and, or 
you can get some targeted education and training, uh, which would be a certificate of achievement. And then sometimes there's available certification, but not often. And we have some confusion. You know, this is our some of our confusion here uh, when we talk about credentialing, because a career pathway involves, you know, a, a way of showing uh, what we have dedicated our learning and practice to. So a lot of times the words certificate and certification are used to mean the same thing and they are actually quite different. Um, and when you're looking at career pathways, you wanna be more clear about what you're bringing forth to the public. So a certificate is provided by an educator. So if I take a class in prenatal massage, that educator cannot give me a certification in prenatal. But that you see that people will say, oh, I'm certified in prenatal massage. There isn't any certification in prenatal massage or geriatric or sports massage or any of that. Um, certification is always provided by an independent body. And in the massage therapy world, the independent body we have is the board certification through the uh, National Certification Board. Um, and a certification board never provides the education. So when we think about our career pathway moving forward, uh, we want to make sure that we are, are representing ourselves accurately. Um, and, and I know of no certifications in most things other than board certification. So Thinking about how we might define ourselves, I always go back to these days, uh, Ann Blair Kennedy, who's one of our researchers in the massage therapy community. And she did her doctoral dissertation on um, a think tank process uh, that was done um, years ago. And I was privileged to be part of that. And then the material never went anywhere. So she pulled all that material together and she came up with these definitions. Um, massage, which is a manual therapy that many occupations and professions can do. Uh, esthetician can do massage. Cosmetologist can do massage. A, 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 an osteopathic physician can do massage. A chiropractor can do massage. A uh, certified nursing assistant can do massage. You know, so, the, so the list is that have massage in their scope of practice is huge. Massage therapy, though, is, is where we start to narrow it into a definition and a scope of practice. So massage therapy is bigger than massage. Massage therapy includes all the hands-on components and all the things we've learned and we do but it also includes an ethical practice and responsibility towards uh, maintaining boundaries and understanding communication and therapeutic relationships and truly developing a therapeutic setting. And then the massage therapy practice then is where do we do this? How do we do that? Are we in a medical setting? like a hospital? Are we in a, a wellness setting like a franchise or a spa? Are we in private practice? Um, do we work for a chiropractor? All of those things then evolve into our massage therapy practice, which is the topic of tonight, which is career pathways. So this is uh, a, uh, also done by Anne and Nikki Monk, one of our other researchers. Um, and uh, from my textbook, uh, Mosby's Fundamentals of Therapeutic Massage. But it talks about what's a successful massage therapist here. So the idea of therapeutic relationships, um, our, how we define and develop our business, our idea of our stamina, 
uh, how many massage sessions does our stamina allow us to do? Uh, what is our business sense? Uh, not everybody has business sense. Um, and a lot of people frustratingly will move into uh, self-employment and they're just not cut out for that. On the other side of that, somebody might feel that their only option is to start in an employment situation, but they're ha unhappy from the get-go because they really want to be uh, self-employed. They have an entrepreneurial spirit with it. One of the confusions we have in our massage community right now is that there, there's a little bit of a biasing around uh, the idea of professional identity and who has more identity. Is somebody who works in a wellness center spa less of a massage therapist than somebody that works in a medical setting? Uh, and that's one of the things any of you that have followed me on Facebook that I post over and over that that, that should not be biased that way. Um, and so that comes into all of this. And then how, what is our, how did we make our choices in our uh, original education? How ethical we, have we been in moving forward in our career pathway? Uh, what have we done with our continuing education? Uh, not just for CEs, not just to get the a number that we need in order to renew our license, not that, but what have we mapped for ourselves? Um, and do we ha have we developed a, a network around ourselves? Do we belong to a professional organization that works for us? Uh, do, do we have a, a group of uh, massage therapists or other wellness practitioners or uh, the, a, a setup within a uh, medical environment um, where we understand, you know, all of the other occupations and what we do and how we fit into that. Have we been able to reach out and find a mentor or, or a mentoring type process? Um, these are all the things that are going to rotate around as we try to figure out for ourselves, how is our, gonna career, how is our career gonna unfold? Uh, and your career has a beginning and a middle and then eventually an end. So the beginning has its own challenges. The middle um, is where a lot of people will settle. They'll settle into their career or they might find themselves um, burned out or they might find that they feel stuck or in a dead end situation. Uh, they might challenge themselves to go on and get an adjunct degree of some type, like maybe they wanna become a chiropractor after working with a chiropractor for many years. Um, they uh, may uh, find that um, they want to really narrow their focus and specialize. Um, and then there's the career end. And we saw a lot of massage therapists at, uh, through COVID where we were all shut down um, that were navigating the end of their career and chose that as a time to uh, drop away and, and not practice. Now I'm 68. I'm still practicing, but I don't practice full time like I used to. Uh, I'm not taking any new clients. I'm seeing the same client structure um, that I have uh, for many years. Um, just prior to this presentation, I just finished with a client and I'm still in my scrubs and um, still got my massage therapist to roll on. And so um, where are you, know, where are you in your career? And, and is there, are you satisfied there? Because that's okay to be satisfied. Uh, or do you feel like you want to, um, you know, uh, refresh, refresh it just a little bit? 
Now, before I end kind of this overview, I do want to um, briefly mention something that at my career and I'm, this is on my bucket list that we would have a unifying language, a unifying language and in a unifying way that multiple wellness and medical professionals can work together and communicate and collaborate. And the International Consortium on Manual Therapies is an international group of physical therapists, massage therapists, osteopathic physicians, a European osteopaths, structural integration, chiropractic, and also opening, you know, open to athletic trainers and uh, others that use manual therapy in their practice. Um, there is going to be a conference in May about this. And uh, it, once you register, you become part of a uh, working group prior to the conference that will work together. Massage therapy group will work together so that we can solidify our confusion <laughs> into a little bit more clarity. And then when we get together at the conference, both on site and virtual, um, we can see how all of us can work together for our, our clients. So there I am in 1985 um, and the newspaper, Little Lapeer, Michigan. Uh, I'd already been practicing for about eight years when this picture was, or this story was done in the paper. <clears throat> 1985 was when the school started. Um, and I'm still here. And uh, single mom, you know, uh, supported a family. It's not always been easy, but I'm still here. And I still have a passion for massage. And I, I think that if we can take a little time to chat, um, questions, comments, you know, I'm gonna take the share screen off. Uh, feel free to um, uh, unmute, uh, ask a question, whether in the chat or just kind of, you know, come forth with something. And we'll navigate it the best we can. We're a fairly small group, which is nice for a platform like this. And let's see if I piqued any interest. Okay, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. And um, Sandy was just whetting our appetite for a larger conversation here. So everyone, I believe, has the ability to turn their videos back on. And also um, the ability to unmute yourself. So if you will give that a try, uh, we'd love to see you on the screen and we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. Um, any challenges that you know of or, you know, just maybe you just need to ask questions about a starting point or as educators, how to further help your students um, take that first step. And okay, the video won't open. Let me, let me see if I can do that from here. And even if you go ahead. Oh, I see. I have to ask you to start your video and then I think we'll get it going. There we go. All right. Oops. So while people are kind of settling and thinking about their question, one of the big ones that we have grappled with for a long time is what's the difference between self-employed and an employee? And how do I know? Um, another one is a lot of confusion about what's the difference between a franchise and a chain? and a, a small business owner and uh, all of that. That's another place that there's a lot of confusion. 
So who wants to break their silence? Renee, I see you <laughs> shaking your head up and down. I was checking my teams, honestly, for my students. But um, I do actually, um, one of the biggest things is trying to get our students to understand the difference between the employee and the uh, contractor and getting them to realize that a lot of people out there are actually treating them like employees, but paying them at contract rate. Yeah. So, and, yeah, let me do a thumbnail on that. One, one. massage therapy. Massage therapy. It's very, very unlikely that you can contract or be an independent contractor. Very unlikely. Uh, most of the time you would be probably classified, uh, it, it misclassified, a misclassified employee. So if you, so, so try to get the word independent contractor, contractor out of your vernacular. You're either self-employed or you're an employee. When you're self-employed, you are you're the massage therapist and you're also the business owner. So you have two jobs. Okay. When you're an employee, you have one job. You're the employee. Your job is massage therapy. The employer takes care of all of the business. Now you can be, this is another area of confusion with massage. You can be paid per hour. You can be paid per massage. You can be paid a percentage of what the fee is charged. You can be paid a combination of all of it. No wonder people don't know what's going on, right? <laughs> so when you are an employee, the employer has a whole bunch of Department of Labor regulations they have to follow. One of them is, is that you have to be paid at least minimum wage for every hour that you work, not every hour you do massage, every hour that you are on site and working. So a lot of times I see ads, you know, um, you're going to make $80 an hour. No, 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 you're not. Can I go there? <laughs> <laughs> they may be saying they're going to pay you $80 a massage or, but that's probably not true either. Right. All right. So you got to be very skeptical about that. Um, just as when you're talking to somebody who's self-employed and they say, I made $150,000 last year. Well, I don't know about that. They might be telling you what they grossed, what their business gross is. But I want to know from a self-employed individual, what did you pay income tax on? What you paid income tax on is relative to what your W-2 would look like if you're an employee. A business owner, whether you're self-employed, remember you're a business owner, or a business owner like I am with the school or my self-employed business where I am my own employer or for the franchise that my family owns, we have to figure out what our wage burden is because we want a solid business. And in a solid business, your wages, your payroll, what you pay yourself or what you pay your employees should not exceed 40% of your business gross. So if you're self-employed and you're charging $80 for a massage, you, you should not be taking out of your business more than $30 for that. Because the rest of that has to go for taxes and overhead expenses and all of that. 
if you're working for an employer, <clears throat> they can't pay you if you're charging $80 a massage. They, they can only pay you 40% if they're going to maintain a business that is viable. Because the employer on top of that has close to another 10% on wages that they have to pay over and above what you get. They have to pay unemployment. They have to uh, pay uh, FICA stuff. They have, there's all kinds of stuff they have to pay for on top of that. People will say, well, if I get a job as a, 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 as a massage therapist, I'm an employee, and, but they're only paying me $20 an hour, or $25 an hour for all hours on the clock. It's not, that's a fair wage. But now when it looks like somebody is saying that they're going to pay you $80 an hour, which is got to be wise on this. Massage therapist in comparison with other health professions in the vocational sector are paid more than any of the others. And many of the others have more education like a, a medical tech or some of those kinds of things. So I get very concerned about new students being disillusioned um, when they are not really understanding what all of them are. And I, I'm not happy with some of the people in my occupation, my peers, that continue to perpetuate this problem. That's one Andy? of the oh. problems. Yes, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, Meryl had submitted a chat. It seems that if it says $80 per massage, that includes includes an expected gratuity. Yep, and that's also a problem. And they should not do that. And so we need to get on the educators or the educators, we need to get on the uh, the people that are advertising for that. And then when you go in and apply for a position like that, one of the very first questions that should be asked is, is I want you to explain succinctly how you figure payroll. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and and uh, an employer cannot count your tips. Yes. They can't do that. So, you know, you take responsibility for yourself on that. Now, my, in my book, in my textbook, in the business chapter, Fundamentals of Therapeutic Massage, I really do go into this in depth. But Renee, you're right on. This is very, very confusing. And I think it does a disservice, especially to the new graduate. It does. A lot of times, <clears throat> as I'm teaching my class, I tell them, if you get an offer for a job, never take it. Tell them you will think about it and call them back. Then call me, talk to me, get all the information you can about what you're being given, and then let's talk about it and let's compare it to your other opportunities and see. And I have had several that have actually done that and gotten a really good deal out of because they come back and they talk. They come back and they ask and they make sure and then I've had some that just jump right in there and they believe what the employer tells them and they're very disillusioned and within six months they're out of it because they're mad because they're not getting paid what they were told they were going to be paid. A lot of that happens because they, they are never, you can't hire a contractor. You can't do right. that. Right. But that's, 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 that's really, really a problem. It is. It's really a problem. Who else has got a, well, I think we got time for one or two. Well, we definitely have time for more questions and comments. So over here where Tiffany is at, I see yes. a lot of heads. There's three faces in that. There is. I've got, uh, a, most of my classes either in the clinic space or at lunch. So these two are like, hey, can we listen to this and kind of understand and get a, feel and meet you know because your name Ruth Warner all those names come up in class and they're like can we like 
hear a lecture from her. Uh, and they actually loved the explanation you gave between the certificates and the certification. That's a big problem because mm -hmm. people are paying for continuing education sure. thinking they need to have a certification to do prenatal or something like that. Now, I absolutely believe if you're going to work towards a situation that has uniqueness to it, you should take it upon yourself to have appropriate education so that you feel confident in that. But there is no certification. We <clears throat> need one to practice because it's not outlined in any of the states. So it becomes an ethical thing. So what else do those masked faces have <laughs> to say from all? <laughs> you guys have anything else? I really appreciate the way that you explain things and break it down to a very understandable level for new graduates and for people who have been in the field for, for years. It's, it makes everything much clearer in a very muddy situation. It is muddy and it's unfortunate. And we could talk about this forever, but mm -hmm. my passion these days, I've had a successful career, right? My passion for, for now is that you all have a successful career. <laughs> A realistically, you know, one that has some work-life balance to it and that not moving into this very humble and extremely important uh, service profession um, with expectations that are going to leave you disillusioned and disenchanted. I, you know, we need massage therapists. We, we need them. Um, and so I'm thrilled whenever I get a chance to talk to students about you know, what they can look forward to. Hopefully the mud will clear. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that hope. Sandy, I, I wanted to jump back um, to two things. First, uh, the consortium, the, the May event that's coming next year. Is there any cost for that or can people attend that? There is a cost. Um, the, the two main doctors that are pulling this together are uh, personally footing the bill for this. And the cost that is there, uh, like for the food and the venue and all of that, the uh, enrollment, the, the goal for the fee to attend is to just cover those costs so that they get their initial money that they put in. On that website, there is a free webinar that we did that's informational. Um, the price point for that, um, we're still in an, er they're still in an early bird registration. The virtual is, is very reasonable. It's like 200, it's like just under $300. Um, and like with you sitting where you, Tiffany, where you're at at a school, you can do a watch party. Um, yeah. Then, um, and, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then um, there's only room for 50 massage therapists to attend. The venue will only hold 300. So uh, they want to make sure that all of the occupations are represented equally and there aren't 50 chiropractors and two physical therapists and whatever because and it's it's not a conference like you're thinking you're going to sit in front of a room and people are going to tell you this is very interactive we're going to get together and we're going to try to figure out this language conundrum and this collaboration conundrum um, so that we can uh, as far as career pathways go we really can work together instead of everybody pulling in different directions. And so that's another one of the things on my bucket list. <laughs> um, thank you for, for addressing that. Um, and I'll mention that um, in the follow-up email, Sandy's PowerPoint presentation will be attached. So the um, website for the consortium will be in that information. Now, I wanted to... Um, ask again about you know the challenges from covid and as a new therapist how you know how you present yourself if you're opening up your own practice 
because I, I believe if you're an employee that those guidelines are already in place. Uh, I mean, how do you go about letting your new clients know that you're practicing um, good protocols for health yeah. and safety? So the COVID really, I think we get it. I think we're figuring it out. I'm, I'm happy to see you all in your masks. Masks are, I think, the thing, you know, nobody is going to die from wearing a mask. So good job over there. You know, my little collective in the corner. Um, the <laughs> um, the idea of putting on your professional, Donnell mentioned, yeah, look in my scrubs. I, I wear scrubs and I make my students wear scrubs. And when I put my scrubs on, I put my roll on. And it, it creates a professional clarity where clients know message if you go I went and got a tooth fixed today and they had their scrubs on you know so it, it, it kind of sets a stage of this is professional uh, it doesn't have to be medical but it is professional um, I think that okay. massage therapists actually were already doing most all of the protocols as far as hygiene and safety that the, the adjustment has been um, in the rest of the world kind of catching up on what was going with that. In our, in our business, our franchise, we are busy. People want massage. They we could, we could book many more massage sessions. And I get calls from all over the place this wanting quality massage therapist. And you know, here's another thing. If, if you're gonna be employed um, and you're not gonna be your own employer, like with self-employed, you need to commit to being an excellent employee. And if you're gonna be an excellent employee, then you deserve to work for an excellent employer. And if the employer isn't excellent, don't work for them. There are <laughs> other employers out there. Uh, and the ones that are not excellent will go away because nobody is going to work for them. But you have to have realistic expectations on what the business end of it is and how it affects. You know, people say, well, charge what you're worth. Well, you know, I live in a blue collar area. I live, you know, if we charge more than $60 for a session, they're not going to pay. They can't. They're only making, you know, the, the income base in the area that I work, the average income is under 40,000, 35 and 40,000. Doesn't matter how much they love massage or they want it or it's been referred or whatever they can't afford that. So, you know, you've got to, you got to look at where you're at when you look at fees and how much you're going to make. And you got to be over um, influenced by people. Maybe they're working on the West coast. You work in, 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 on the West coast, you can charge a higher fee, but the cost of living is higher. You know, it all balances itself out. So now if you go in my area, if you go 50 miles South, you could probably get 75 okay. you know, because of the difference in the demographic. Andy, a chat came in. Uh, from Jose, question, how much money therapists will, the minimum to expect, okay, I didn't read this first, so Jose, you might need to jump in here, um, question, how much money therapists will, the minimum to expect earning per client, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, yeah, in a chiropractic clinic, Oh, now chiropractic, that's a very interesting world, chiropractic, and chiropractors as employers, Chiropractors have been the ones that wanted to treat you as an independent, pay you as an independent contractor, but treat you as an employee. So if you are going, to, if they are going to bill insurance, you can't bill it, except maybe in Washington state or something. But if they're going to bill insurance, you have to be an employee. 
So, because and there's been a lot of chiropractors that got caught up in insurance fraud because they didn't do this right. So a lot of the chiropractors have had to make the decision, am I going to turn these people into an employee status or am I going to rent them space? Now, if they rent you space, you're a landlord. And the only, you know, they are your landlord. And the only direction they can give you on anything is how you interact in that facility and how much rent you pay them. So if you're an employee now, demographics is going to make a difference. All right. So I go back to the idea of business growth and a wage burden. So in a viable business, that means that doesn't mean that the employer is making a million bucks now. This just means that the business isn't worrying about if it's going to have enough money to pay payroll. Right. But the business owner should make as much as their massage therapists. <laughs> All right. So uh, you'd be surprised how often that does not occur. <laughs> so the, the wage burden should not be more. Actually, it should be 35% is what it should be. So if you look at a um, base rate of, let's use $100 because I can do the math on it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if you're 35% of that, that's $35 you've got to pay in wages for an hour session at $100. $35 for that session, you've got to make sure you cover minimum wage, you've got to cover your support staff, your cleaning, your front desk, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, that is going to put that down to where the the employer has got about thirty dollars, about thirty dollars uh, to pay the massage therapist, um, and a lot of them are paying way above that. A lot of business uh, business owners are paying massage therapists fifty percent of the business growth, and they're are going to struggle. That really puts the business in jeopardy. So, so now that gets to your question, Jose, of how much can I get expected to get paid per hour? So uh, if you're getting 20 to 25 an hour, all hours on the clock, all hours on the clock, um, you're getting, a, you have to figure it out. You might be getting 30, 35 a massage, if you're paid per massage, but you got to take that back to all hours on the clock. So in a six hour day, you can't do six hours of massage. You can only do five. All right, so there's a lot of these nuances you've got to figure out in it. So if I can tell you what we pay, I can, you know, and I'm in a blue collar middle America area, um, our massage therapist, for a half hour, um, our, I pay them base. They get uh, a base for all hours on the clock plus a premium for each massage session, each massage hour. So when they do a half hour, they're making $20. They do an hour they're making about 25, right? So it doesn't seem fair, does it? No. No, I, because it costs way more to do a 30 minute massage than it does to do a mm. so, uh, That's why I've never been a, a proponent of the 30 minute session. So a 30 minute session is only about 25 minutes. So a 60 minute session, an hour session is about 50 minutes. And they get between, depending, depending on the little factors, they get between 25 and $27 for that. But if you average it out over what they make per hour, all hours on the clock, 
uh, they're making about 18 to 19 per hour, all on the clock. Uh, and then the, we are in a service in the area. Now, you wouldn't get it in a chiropractor. You wouldn't get gratuities in the chiropractic office. Uh, but they get all of their tips. Well, I, I hate to jump in, but... Oh, we're over time. Look at what we uh, did. <laughs> we be over time. I'm not ready for it to end. Um, so I'm giving you two minutes. I want you to share with the audience what you shared with me, which is a trend that you saw in the uh, industry as for... Um, the collective office space. Yeah, um, there's a there's. You have to wrap it up. I'm so sorry. There's a trend in self for self-employed, where somebody will rent a larger office space, and then they will sublet to you, um, either by the day or by the week or by the month or whatever, and. Uh, there's also the concept where it's a business where you register, so you got two rooms to, to rent, you can register your space and then somebody who wants to work, doesn't want to have to sign a big lease and all that, they can match them up so that they can find more reasonable space. And I think this is something that is going to occur for those that want to be self-employed. Oh, you, know, you can be employee and self-employed. You can do both. Just be ethical in both areas. You can do both at the same time. Be a great employee when you're a great employee. And then be a great employee for yourself when you're self-employed. All right. Well, thank you, Sandy. And what I'd like to mention is there will be a follow-up email. Sandy's PowerPoint okay. will be presented. Um, and... I can't believe we're already in November. We've got three edu talks left. On November 23rd, it will be red flags, the warning signals for inappropriate clients. And that is with Felicia Brown. December 7th, we'll have demystifying the world of kinesiology taping with Drew Freeman. Oh, excellent. And and December 14th, to wrap up our year, we have how trigger points plus stretch plus corrective exercise and re equal reduced muscle pain and tension. And that is Sandy Dirks and Enid Whitaker. We have a full schedule for next year, but these are the last talks of the year. They're great topics and we hope you'll join us. Watch your inbox for an invitation. And thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank cool. you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank, thank you. you all for participating tonight. And, and Sandy, thank you. I'm pretty active on Facebook, so you can message me. I'm pretty good about responding that way. So. Also, I might as well say Sandy will be presenting in 2022 an edu talk on how to be a good employee. So we'll pick it up there next year. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much and have a great and safe evening. Take care. <laughs>